Okay, so uh, it's my honor to introduce Professor Max Welling. Uh, Professor Max Welling is a research chair in machine learning at the University of Amsterdam and uh, uh, vice president of technologies of, uh, at Qualcomm. He has a, also a secondary appointment as a senior fellow at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And he's been, uh, he served as the associate editor in chief of uh, PAMI, uh, IEEE PAMI for from 2011 to 2015. And he serves on the board of uh, NIPS, now called uh, New Ritz Foundation since 2015 and has been program chair and general chair of NIPS uh, in 2013 and 14. He was also program chair at uh, AI Stats in 2009, ECCV in 2016 and general chair of Middle in uh, 2018. And he was the, in 2010, the recipient of the Kundering Prize, uh, ECCV Kundering Prize. He's also the co-founder and board member of the Innovation Center for AI um, and the European Lab for Learning and Intelligence Systems. He directs now the Amsterdam Machine Learning Lab and co-directs the Qualcomm UVA, University of Amsterdam Deep Learning Lab and the Bosch UVA Deep Learning Lab. He has more than 300 scientific publications in machine learning, computer vision, and statistics and physics. And today he's going to talk uh, to us about uh, bits, qubits, and qubits for for deep learning. So, a very exciting talk. A very exciting talk, I'm sure. So, uh, thank you. Very thank, much. thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Luca, for the in nice introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about a somewhat new topic for me, which is uh, sort of caught my attention recently. I, so this is a somewhat new talk. There's bits and pieces of older talks, but it's sort of a lot of it is new. And um, so therefore, it's not completely ironed out yet. Um, now, I'm going to talk about basically the most fundamental pieces of information in computer science, uh, which are bits. Uh, classical bits, um, and um, we are going to extend this idea to probabilistic bits, uh, Bayesian bits, uh, and then move on to qubits, uh, which, which are clearly already things that are well known. Um, and then we will talk about quantum Bayesian bits, which are we sort of call Cuba bits. Um, and of course, all in the context of machine learning and deep learning. So the overview is Bayesian bits, qubits, deep learning with Cuba bits and then uh, discussion. Okay, so let's think for a second about um, what is a bit. Well, of course we all know uh, the bit is a, you know, uh, a gate which can either be zero or one. And we can place it on sort of two different axes. Um, and sort of at the, we would put at the distance one, we would put in the horizontal axis, let's say the zero bit and we put a distance one at the x-axis, we put the uh, the one bit, the, the, well, the, not the bit, but the value for that bit. So we have two states in this system, clearly. Now we can extend that to a probability distribution over those two states, and the prob we can sort of parameterize the probability of the bit to take value one with the parameter of theta drawn from a Bernoulli, which is the most general distribution over that. And then um, if, you, if you vary theta, you yeah. basically, move over this line here. Um, and basically what I will be introducing also in this talk and talk about next is the Bayesian bit, which is simply a probabilistic bit, but, but where that probability distribution is now a posterior distribution uh, given data. So basically you can think of that as the value of a parameter um, and we set, we learn that posterior probability distribution for that value of that bit by looking at, at data. Now we wrote a paper um, which was presented um, at NeurIPS this year, uh, which is precisely that, Bayesian bits. Um, and we did this to unify the concepts of quantization and pruning. Now, let me try to explain how that works. The idea is basically to adaptively decide how many bits you need for a particular calculation. And then in particular, we talk about 
the parameters in this case. So we want to decide, we want to sort of have a flexible scheme to prune uh, parameter values away, but not just to prune values away, also decide on what precision we need for that particular bit to do our computations. And we want to learn it from data directly. Now, um, for practical reasons, there's two restrictions. The first one is we're not gonna actually put a different distribution over every parameter, but we do it per kernel. So basically for every layer. Otherwise, there's a lot of parameters to move around. The other thing is, but you could, for instance, also do per channel or something like that, right? Um, the other thing is that we will, our, we will decide on the number of bits in factors of two. And that's not really sort of, uh, there's any principled reason for that, except for the fact that it's good for hardware. So in hardware, it's easier to work with either two, four, eight, 16 bits, rather than with five or seven bits. Um, okay, so then what we're basically gonna define is a quantized value of, of, of X. Now X, think of X as a parameter, and we're gonna quantize that value called XQ. And we see here in the picture, this is the distribution over all of the weights, let's say of a learned neural network. And in a first approximation, we're gonna use two bits. And that means that the values of the, you know, of any one of these weights is going to be quantized to either this value on this extreme part of the regime, to this value, to this value, or to this value. And alpha and beta is sort of the min and the max of the regime. So if you are here, then you get sort of mapped to your closest, you know, value right here. Okay, so then, at the next level, we need to decide, you know, do we need an additional bit to represent, let's say, the, the errors that we're making? Now, if you look at, you know, this file here, everything in this regime here gets mapped onto this, onto this point. So basically, we can look at the, you know, the errors that we're making here. So basically, all these values here are the differences between this value and the actual value you know, that, that we take. So we have some negative errors and we have some positive errors in this regime. And this is fairly uniformly distributed. So it does make a lot of sense to add higher resolution to represent these different values for these errors. So now we're gonna put two more bits so that now we can put these values here in more bins. So now this value gets first mapped, you know, basically to, to this error bit at this level, you know, and that's relative to this level value at, at the previous level. So this means that the total quantization now looks like this, right? Which says, well, first tell me what is the value of the first level of quantization, which is the green value. And then if the second gate Z is on, now tell me within this range here, you know, which of the quantized, again, quantized error values you picked, which means that you now move to this particular pile, for instance, and so on. So we basically can write out our value Q for any, you know, say uh, 16 int or whatever, representation of our real value, we can say, it. well, there's a first gate which decides, are we actually going to consider this particular bit at all? And if yes, then, you know, the first value that we need to consider is X2. That's the quantized values to these green piles. Now, next, ask whether, you know, we need the next bit in this representation. And if so, then we're gonna put Z4 to be open, to be one. And then we're gonna include epsilon four to our representation of XQ and so on. And so the Zs here are going to be the gates that we need to posteriorly decide on given data for every kernel, whether we're gonna use this precision or this precision, et cetera, et cetera. So the Zis therefore are these, you know, two to the power, you know, number of bits that we are going to use in our computations. So basically the picture that you could have in mind is that of a series of guillotines. So you start off with your X and then the first decision you're gonna make is, 
do I actually need this, you know, this parameter at all? And if we don't, we chop it off. Now at this next level, we say, okay, we have decided that we want this particular bit to be in our model. Then we're going to ask ourselves, do we want, let's say, you know, the first bit or the, you know, of course you've already decided on, you know, on the first two bits because it's going in factors of two, but let's say we do it per bit here. So we've decided on the first bit now, and then we ask the, the second question, which is, do we need another bit to represent this particular parameter? And if not, we chop it off and we just have a one bit representation or, or two bit in the, in the, in the hardware friendly case. And if we, if we do, then we're gonna add another bit to the representation or another two bits to the representation so that um, we are sort of maintaining higher precision. And these gates here, um, they are going to be controlled by a learning process. Now, um, in some more detail, we're gonna have to put a prior on these um, on these gate values, um, k is the parameter that we're considering here, or the kernel that we're considering. We put a prior, which is a Bernoulli distribution because it's a binary variable, and we're going to also write a parameterized posterior distribution, which um, we indicate by q phi for the first bit, and that's a Bernoulli distribution again, but it's now parameterized. So it's parameterized as a sigmoid of um, you know, some learnable parameter phi that we're going to learn in, uh, you know, in a minute. And then at the next level, we can say, well, given that the first gate was on, we're going to have a prior distribution that the second gate is on, et cetera, for, for all of these gates, which is again, these Bernoulli's. And the posterior distributions, we're going to say, again, we're going to make it learnable, but we have two, two flavors. The first flavor is if the, the previous gate was open, then we will consider the next gate to be open and using learnable parameters. But if the previous gate was closed, then it doesn't make sense to open a later gate because you know everything was chopped off. And so these probabilities need to be zero. Because that's the parameterization for the gates. And then we move through the usual steps of a uh, you know writing down uh, you know a likelihood and then approximating that with an evidence lower bound. Um, and the evidence lower bound looks like this. So I have my likelihood. I know this is a Bayesian model, so we're integrating out all our parameters. But these Zs now are switch variables that we need to that we need to entertain and, and, and define posteriors over. So we come up with a posterior distribution over the joint distribution over all of these switches, which we will approximate by independent distribution. So each switch will act independently. And then to avoid that all these switches, these probability distributions just turn into delta peaks, we will also have a KL term, which you need, you know, if you do the approximation of your evidence lower bound, it is, a, it is basically the, the, the distance between the priors that we have set and the posteriors Q. Now, if you go through some calculations, you can, you know, this term nicely turns into, and some approximations actually as well, you know, this term nicely turns into this term. This is again, it's still the same term, which is trying to fit the data. But this term is basically putting a regularization on these gates to encourage them to close. So and you can think of, so B is um, the bit width that is available for that you know, particular, you know, there's a couple of bit widths, right, that you want to consider. And then, um, so you, you run over the, over the gates inside those bits and then K runs over the parameters. So this is basically saying there's a penalty for opening up that particular gate. And we want to encourage the gates to be closed because then you get sort of sparse models with lots of, uh, you know, and, and highly quantized models as well. Now you can do some experiments um, and then you see that um, in, on the X axis, we put the number of bit operations. Um, and then on the Y axis, we put the accuracy of some models. This is a ResNet 18 model. And um, this is, I think on ImageNet, yeah. So these are large models and uh, they're, well, they're large data sets um, and these are trained for ResNet 18, which is already a fairly efficient model. But now you can see that if you're to the left upper corner, you know, you're sort of getting the maximum accuracy out of your number of bit operations on your hardware. Um, due to the sparsity that you induce. And then you see that, you know, if you learn the sparsity, 
you can get very nice curves here, trade-off curves here, uh, compared to sort of um, other methods. And you know, here is a for another net mobile v v2 net, which is already a far more efficient architecture. And you see that it, it performs quite well. Now you can also look and investigate the actual architectures that you learn uh, or prune. Um, and so here we see that um, you know the total bit width that the, that the model computed or estimated that was necessary you know on a particular accuracy. And you see that in the beginning it is quite happy to use very low quantization levels. Um, and so here is a similar one for a bigger model. Uh, in this case, what you see is that, and this is a trend a little bit, in the first layer, it wants more precision. So I guess to do, you because you're looking at an image with a lot of sort of details and you want to compute all the edges and all these things. So you want to have high precision in the first layer. Um, and then as you go further, it's happy to maintain in the, in the intermediate layers, it's happy to entertain lower levels of quantization. And then towards the end, it is again going to um, increase its bit width at the sort of fully connected layers where it needs to make its final predictions. And this is sort of a trend that we are seeing. The green bars are sort of the sparsity you get at the activations due to the fact that you do a lot of pruning um, at the middle, at the layers or at the weights in the layer before. So, so this is kind of interesting that you kind of can now absolutely learn the, the, the width, the, the, the accuracy with which you want to do your computations. Okay, so now we're switching over and you know to a sort of a completely different topic it seems, but I will sort of need this perspective later um, to talk about quantum bits. Now, this is work with Mark Finzi and uh, Roberto Bondeson. Um, and um, so the idea is we were inspired here by neural ODEs. And we were thinking about what is an image really? Um, so we tend to think of it as a regular, as, as a bunch of pixels on a, in a regular grid, but really you wanna think about it as a continuous signal on a plane. And um, in fact, I could have, you know, missed a whole bunch of pixels, or I could have an irregular gridding, let's say super pixels of the image. And that should really not give, you know, I should be able to use the same neural or architecture or model to make my predictions. And moreover, if I just do these kind of operations, I, you know, the end result shouldn't be all that different from the previous result. Now clearly, if you do something like this and you've trained a model for a regular grid, you can't even apply it. You just, your convolutions won't work. Now, the way we we approach this is by thinking about this as a basically as a as an ODE. So if we take the continuum limit, and I'll show in a minute how we do that, it's using a Gaussian process, and then on the Gaussian process we define a PDE, uh, you know, differential equation. We say that um, so the linear layer now is you start with a particular function, you know, on the input, which is your image, or maybe it's RGB. You have three three images here. Um, that's your initial state. And then we're going to evolve it using a PDE to, let's say, for one unit of time to arrive at the pre nonlinearity activations for the next layer. And so, one question is you know, this is quite natural. Of course, you evolve over time. You know, you can ask the question, what is this D? It's some operator that acts on F, which is, has a whole bunch of differentials in it, like first and second order derivatives, um, if you want a local. Uh, sort of operator, which is reasonable because we are thinking about convolutions. Now, the formal solution to this looks like this, but that doesn't tell you very much. You have to interpret this as a Taylor series. You can actually write this out as a convolution. Okay, so the picture here is now that we're going to have our input, which is in this case a line, but you know, it's for an image, it's two dimensional. Our, we have points on that input space. Now we're going to first fit a Gaussian process to that space. So that looks like this. Um, and uh, sort of we now have a continuous function defined per definition through this Gaussian process, not only for the mean, but also for the variance of that Gaussian process. And so we basically represent the input data by these two continuous functions, the mean and the, and the standard deviation functions. Then we're going to apply this operator A, which is the solution 
you know, of our PDE, or you can think of it, we take this as input and we evolve it using our PDE. Then we get to a nonlinearity. There it gets a little ugly because uh, now we have to have a Gaussian state. We push it through a nonlinearity, it's no longer Gaussian. You then have to map it back onto a Gaussian and, and then in order for you to continue again. So then we also have a mixing sort of pixel wise uh, sort of mixing state, which basically takes pixels and, 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 and combines things. Um, and the reason we need to do that is to make things more Gaussian. Okay, so therefore, um, again, so here's our PDE that we use. Uh, we have a mean, you know, this is for the, actually to, to forget this, to look at the last line only. So we have a mean function and we have a standard deviation function. Um, we evolve using this differential equation. Now this differential equation has two terms. It has a drift term, which is the first derivative, and it has a second order diffusion term. And the second order diffusion term is actually never considered in neural networks. So you will have, to, it, it's sort of more like a stochastic PDE that you have to run in order to, to use the second term. But as we know that normal convolutional neural networks are completely deterministic, they just basically take pixel values and map them on other pixel values deterministically. So that corresponds to just this term. It's kind of interesting that this becomes more like a probabilistic layer where you also diffuse um, the, the, the values. Now you can put these things together so you can create a whole bunch of these differential operators with different parameters. Um, and then you put things together with a matrix W with learnable coefficients. You know, uh, it indexes K, which is the different, you know, filters if you want that we use. And there's A, B, which is for the different channels. And then we evolve under that thing. It turns out that the solution you know, looks like this. And you can rewrite it using a Green's function, which then turns it into a convolution. If you use you know, only these two terms, it becomes a convolution with a normal uh, sort of distribution with a mean minus beta and a variance sigma, if you evolve it for one unit of time. And then you, you mix all of these things with your operator W and then convolve that with F. So it, it looks a lot like a normal convolution in some sense, but there is this additional sort of diffusion term. I talked about that. Um, so we also have to figure out how to apply this actually to, to a GP. So we've just thought about how to apply it to a function, which is like you would apply it to the mean, but you also need to apply it to the kernel. The kernel is just a covariance. It's a, it's a rank two tensor. And so, Basically, um, you have to act on the right also with the transpose of A. Now, the nice thing is that um, since this is a GP with a particular kernel, and we can choose that kernel to be like a RBF kernel, and the solution here is an actual convolution also with a Gaussian kernel, with these two choices, you can actually do this operation exact. So you can, the linear operator now becomes just Gaussian convolution, which is very nice. Then of course you have to do the ReLU. As I said, you, you can actually compute the first two moments of the distribution that results, um, but you have to do some approximations to map it again to a Gaussian process with the right kernel, the kernel that we really want, um, so that we can do the same operation at the next level. Um, and, and to make sure that things remain Gaussian, we also act with a, with a mixing matrix at the end that mixes the different channels together. Okay, so then the whole picture. So now we basically move through one of you know these layers. We of course repeat that in many layers, and we make it such that we can backpropagate through this whole process. The nice thing about this is that we now make also differentiable the locations where we do our GP evaluation, right? So we can just choose the GP evaluation points to be exactly the points on the input, but we don't have to. We can choose to do less integration points here, and of course when we do less points the uncertainty in the GP should go up. And so that corresponds to a noisier sort of version of the neural network that is more uncertain in the middle. It creates additional uncertainty and noise in the middle. But you can now fine tune this. And in fact, you can learn these points to move to arbitrary positions where you need more precision for your integration. We didn't do that in this paper, but it's certainly possible. Okay, so here's some results. I won't go into it. It's, it talks, for instance, about if you increase the resolution of your pixels, 
do you indeed see that the uncertainty in your predictions are going down? And that's exactly what happens in each one of these layers. The variance of the Gaussian process goes down as one of a square root of n, um, the standard deviation, which is precisely what we want. Um, and also you can see if it's calibrated, let's see if the uncertainties that it predicts is, is somewhat reasonable. And, and it turns out the uncertainties are indeed somewhat reasonable. The results are sometimes like very much better than the state of the art. Uh, for the super pixel sort of MNIST data set. Um, for others, it was more of a challenge to get really a lot better. Um, so for instance, this for this particular data set, which is like points on the, you know, let's say people that come into an ICU or are admitted into a hospital, which happens at irregular times, um, you know, you get some benefit, but not a huge amount. Okay, so the next part of my talk, let me check my time quickly. Um, so the next part of my talk, is about um, quantum mechanics. So as I said, um, you know, as I was discussing bits, we have bits, we have probabilistic bits. Um, and now there's an interesting thing, which is that um, there's on a quantum computer, people use qubits. And um, in some sense, a qubit is a, sort of a generalized version of a normal bit. Um, and the way that it's more general is that in fact, the possible states that it can take are living on the surface of a sphere. In fact, in fact, you can think of it, it's entirely inside the sphere if you also think about mixed states. But if you th only think about pure states, then in fact, the, the, um, the, uh, the, the states that, that, that this qubit can take are living on the surface of the sphere. And you can think of that as basically a vector zero one uh, mapped by a unitary trans two, two by two unitary transformation to get you this, this object psi, which is your wave function. Uh, often we indicate that, you know, like this with this cat notation. And um, it's important to realize that that's not actual the probability. The probability is this, the square of this amplitude. So the probability that, um, you know, a, a bit takes on value one after a measurement is given by the square of this probability of this amplitude. Now, these amplitudes are complex, so you have to take absolute values. And due to the fact they are complex, they can they can cancel thing, uh, each other, which is an interesting phenomenon in quantum mechanics. Now, um, bits can now be in superposition. This is somewhat similar to what I said before for probabilistic bits, but now the coefficients that combine are no longer probabilities, but as I said, they're square roots of probabilities, and so they live on us on the surface of a sphere rather than you know on this on this poly. Uh, uh, gone. Um, oops. And um, and so they, they have to satisfy this relationship. Now you can also take two bits and you can also superimpose all of those. And now you need four different complex numbers and all of those have to add up to one if you take the absolute value squared. Uh, and this we call entanglement. And so you can see that in these quantum computers, you can basically represent a state which is an arbitrary, basically, superposition of all of these classical states, which is what makes it quite powerful. Um, and you can even get these, these states which are maximally entangled, which, which, which is basically your two people have a bit, you know, they're, they're entangled. One could be in Jupiter and the other one can be, you know, on the other side of the universe. Um, and they're now entangled. So if one takes a measurement and finds zero, then the other one will instantaneously also in, you know, if they do the measurement at the same time, we'll also find the same value zero, which is a bit weird in the sense that it feels like things are now connected in, um, in ways that, you know, signaling can go faster than the speed of light. In fact, it can't. Um, but this collapse of this wave function is, is very mysterious indeed. Um, and it has led people to consider these kind of Bell inequalities, which state that you can try to think of this as sort of with hidden variables, basically stating that, well, all of this uncertainty is due to the fact that we don't know the underlying sort of state with lots of hidden variables, which could sort of represent this, this correlation. The point is that these Bell inequalities sort of forbid that. They basically say, well, you can't really do that because um, you, you know, any classical theory with, uh, you know, with, um, you know, which is uh, with lots of hidden variables would actually not violate the Bell inequalities, where um, we observe, we have observed, or physicists have observed that in fact, Bell inequalities are 
um, violated by quantum mechanics. Now, um, the other thing which is important is that, you know, if we start to compute with these sort of amplitudes, we get phenomena which are new um, uh, to us if we, as classicists, as basically people who use probabilities, and that's because these amplitudes can interfere with each other. And then, you know, this is this famous two-slit experiment. If you have individual particles, individual photons that you can actually see if you detect them, they sort of create indiv individual specks on the screen. You know, it can happen that, you know, there's particles going through here, particles going through here with probability half. But then um, at this point, you will not, never see a particle, which is weird because you would classically just add up these probabilities and you would get more particles here rather than less, but they destructively interfere. Okay, so now in, in, in uh, machine learning, of course, so the one question you can ask yourself and we've been asking ourselves is, can you use these, this phenomena in, in machine learning? Well, the first thing to do is, that's why I introduced this previous sort of thing with the PDE, is you can write down a Schrodinger equation. And it looks like this, it's again a first order derivative. So here's the old equation of some function xt, which was the image. And then, you know, have some operator with derivatives. You know, we had that here, applying on psi, and we have an initial condition. It all looks very similar. You know, we can even write the solution in a very similar way. The problem is this i here, which changes to everything completely. Um, so now things become more like waves and also remind you that in fact, you know, the way we interpret the solution, this wave function is by stating that there's a probability of finding the particle at a particular position after a measurement. Now that's not what we need because if we want a image, then we want sort of values classically, let's say you could think after measurement, but we want values at every pixel of our image. And so we really need to go to fields of qubits. So think of an array of qubits, which is also what a quantum chip basically implements. And each one of these points on this qubit now is actually now one of these, you know, these spheres. And there is these, these operators which connect these qubits. And now you can do complicated computations. There has been two claimed quantum supremacy events where the computation that was done by the actual quantum computer could not have been done in any reasonable amount of time by a classical computer. It's still heavily debated, I guess. What's really important is you can do these, that you do these calculations that, they, that the environment doesn't pollute these qubits because as soon as you pollute them, but then, you know, they get entangled with, with bits in the environment, then the whole computation sort of becomes classical again. And that's what we don't want. And that's why these things have to be super cool and very, you know, very complicated. Remains the question whether all of this is useful for machine learning. Now, what we did in order to try to make a beginning to answer this question is to say, well, all right, let's think about a quantum computer and let's think about, you know, a deep learning architecture and combine these things. So the first thing is, we're gonna input a quantum state X, which corresponds, if we think of this as a binary state, uh, which is their input image. Now this is a field of qubit states. And then we are also gonna need a whole bunch of, you know, bits for the parameters in our neural net. Now to make our lives easy for this paper, we're gonna use binary weights. You know, people have done probabilistic binary nets, so why not do sort of qubit binary, sort of qubit uh, nets here. Where the, where the parameters that we're going to use are actually uh, going to be uh, binary, but then you know the, the quantum version of that is sort of a Q binary. Okay, and uh, because this is now a state that we are going to learn, I mean, this is, a, this is a superposition with two coefficients, alpha and beta, and those coefficients we're going to learn from data we can call this a Bayesian qubit because the, the value of the superposition is being determined by the, um, by the data and the learning process. So that's, that's your uh, cuba bit. Um, okay, so then what we need to do in a, in a quantum computer is we need to sort of entangle all of these things. So we need to take our input space, our parameter states, and we're going to entangle all of these things together using a unitary operator, this Q. It turns out that what we need is, you know, this for technical reasons, we need to add some additional ancilla bits, which is basically bits that we add to the computation, auxiliary states that we need for the computation. All of that is being put in, sorry, I have an echo. So all of this is being put in, um, 
in a, in, a, in a block, which we call quantum phase estimation. And, and what we try to achieve here, the first thing we try to achieve is to just see if we can implement a classical computation on a quantum computer. And for that, we, would, we needed this quantum phase estimation algorithm, which is a well-known algorithm, and where you, for which you need these. It, it's based on, uh, on, on fast Fourier transforms, and, and which you can do very quickly on a quantum computer. OK, so we have two neurons in this case. So we have our first neuron, which is given by this guy, and we have our second neuron, which is given by this guy you know, and this guy. So we need two sets of auxiliary states here. These are mapped to this. These are mapped to this. Um, so, you know, let's say the first set of parameters goes into the first calculation and the second set of parameters goes into the second set of and second, second calculation. OK, so then they gave an answer. You know, we need to maintain all the lines because it has to be unitary. So it has to be a reversible computation. Um, but we're going to only read out one for each neuron. So we're going to read out this guy for the first neuron. We're going to read out this guy for the second neuron. Sorry, that's wrong. Um, we're going to read out this guy for the second neuron. We're going to read out, uh, where is it? Uh, oh, yeah, so the, this one for the first neuron. So these are the readout cube and silica qubits. And it turns out that you can show that the answer is going to be that the state of this of this neuron is look it looks like this. So it's just an ordinary layer in a neural network where you take the input states H, you multiply them by a uh, weight matrix W, um, and then you normalize this thing, and and you take the nonlinearity, which is in this case uh, sort of a threshold function. So all of that is automatically implemented by reading out this one, and then all the other garbage you just discard. Now that information from both of these layers, plus a new set of fresh new set of weights, goes into another quantum phase estimation, um, you know, tool. We have also some additional ancilla qubits, and then we read out basically the final line, which is this one here, and we do an actual observation here. Um, and we want that that's a pro that we get a probabilistic answer. It, it has two possible values, zero and one, and we match that to the actual data, and then we backpropagate through this whole system to set all the parameters of these superpositions. Okay, so that's what we do. And you can think of this process once you've trained it. You can think of this here moving forward. Is is of course just the gates in a quantum computer, but you can also think of that as basically using Schrodinger equation to evolve a state forward in time. So this is basically the solution to a, Schrodinger, to a type of Schrodinger equation um, that is implemented by a quantum computer. OK, so um, now uh, instead of, so, so the next step that we want to do is to say, well, that was a classical computation. Now let's actually do something more quantum. And we can do that by now doing, instead of just quantum phase estimation, writing down more complicated entanglement transformation. So now we can just do quantum entanglement of, let's say, you know, blocks. So we take these two blocks and we entangle them and we tangle these and we have Q blocks which entangle these things. So if we do a couple of layers of these then everything gets entangled together. Um, and now we are venturing into the realm of quantum computation, things that you could not do efficiently with a classical comp computer. In the end, you can sort of figure, try to think about what does this all compute? And basically what's happening is that, you know, your wave function computes a probability distribution that looks like this. Um, it has a joint probability distribution over the activations and the, and the parameters of your layer. And that now gets convolved with basically this delta function. So just doing this delta function um, is actually what we do classically which is the normal update because this F is just a, a classical layer. But now we have this huge probability distribution where all the weights and, and, um, and, and latent variables are all sort of entangled together in a joint probability distribution and now we convolve that. And all of that can be done efficiently, even though it's an exponential number of states this thing can be in, can be done efficiently on a quantum computer. Of course, you cannot really check that classically. That, that's, the, that's the issue. But what we did manage to do is to approximate all of this with uh, sort of using central limit theorems and stuff like that. And then we can show, in fact, that for the first time, you know, on realistic data sets, you know, people typically look at, you know, four times four images or something like this. So we looked at realistic data in this approximation, and we can get 
good results. By just actually replacing the first layer by a quantum layer, we can get very good results relative to sort of the binary classical version. Right, so to discuss uh, this, um, basically we have sort of classical neural nets, we have quantum neural nets, and sort of in the middle, there is an interesting regime um, where we can try to build basically quantum inspired neural nets, which is things you can still simulate classically efficiently, um, but which are built on the principles of sort of quantum reasoning. And sort of that's the version here that we could actually simulate with. Um, it's unknown whether this is gonna give us a great advantage or maybe this can be easily simulated or by say a, a classical uh, different architecture. However, you know, there's always, of course, the hope that the quantum architectures, the full quantum architectures, which you can only run efficiently on a quantum computer, can actually do better than the classical ones. Uh, but it's unknown, I would say. Um, so we treat um, parameters and hidden states all with qubits. And so in some sense, you can think of this as quantum Bayes. You can make this more precise. So in fact, you can write down Bayes rule in quantum language. And so the whole thing is is very precise. And basically what we're doing is, is quantum Bayesian learning. Um, and sort of it is quantum mechanics provides this different theory for statistics than probability theory. It's very interesting to think about to what does this sort of apply? What kind of systems are, are served by this kind of new perspective? And, and of course, the strange thing about it is that you get these uh, these these interferences and somehow, you know, what does that correspond to classically? Perhaps we, we don't know really. Um, and uh, so there's sort of, of course the big million dollar question is does this provide better, more powerful deep learning models in the future when we have quantum computers available? So to conclude, um, so it's kind of fun to think about the fundamental pieces of information um, for computer science and sort of we've gone from Bayesian bits to qubits, but we got classical bits, probabilistic bits, Bayesian bits, qubits, and now Cuba bits. And I think there's an interesting future for that kind of modeling. Um, we've looked at partial differential equations, um, basically describing linear layers in the continuum limit of a convolutional neural net. Now we've shown that the Schrodinger equation does in fact also, is in fact an, an ex example of a PDE um, for quantum neural nets. And uh, we've shown that, you know, if you, you really need fields of these quantum bits and, and, and run the Schrodinger equation on these fields rather than on, on individual bits. Um, or individual sort of wave functions, if you want. Um, now, this is potentially more powerful due to this entanglement and this idea that you can do, a, you know, a heavy parallel computation. But you basically, you can think of this as a as, as a parallel computation over all these different possible states, um, exponential number of possible states. It's known that not everything can be sped up, and um, and it's certainly not known whether this new power will give us better models in machine learning. Um, now, it's, it is interesting to see the interaction between physics and computer science, uh, which basically takes shape in, the, in this, you know, these, these, these quantum computers, and to think about other ways that we can integrate physics. We have, we have done quite a bit of work on symmetries, uh, which resulted in group convolutional neural nets and gauge uh, convolutional neural nets and all these things. And, 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 and that seems to be a very fruitful way of thinking. Um, and, you know, who knows, there is a lot of other interesting ideas lurking in mathematics and physics that could also be very interesting to um, use in the field of machine learning. And with that, um, I want to stop and maybe give back to the chair for a question session. Thank you very much for the uh, great talk. And so um, I would like to, if anybody wants to ask any question, we have I think plenty of time. Is there any question? Well, I, I do have a couple of questions to start off perhaps. Um, so I've been working myself as well with this um, a little bit, but uh, obviously not in the context of deep learning actually, of essentially using these quantum ideas as um, to untap some sort of um, more powerful mathematical tools to solve problems in graph theory in particular in my case. So um, like in this case of this architecture, we, you have just discussed. So you write here that uh, we can get potentially 
they could, this well you showed that it was more powerful in fact in those uh, results you had at the end so interference here um, do you have an intuition of how it provides this uh, increased computational power that you observed experimentally well I guess um, in some sense it's used in this quantum phase estimation because uh, but that but um, but the but that's just actually just an implementation of the classical neural net. So that's not more powerful. Um, so basically after that, we took this deformed neural net. So we, we added terms to these quantum phase estimation unitaries that, um, that would create these kind of entangled states. Um, and I think the, the the easiest, you know, whether it's interference or whether it's, uh, you know, entanglement or whatever is the actual reason for this to be potentially more powerful, I don't know precisely, mm -hmm. but I would say that um, the fact that you can entertain, you know, let's say in your computer, a probability distribution or a, an amplitude over all these states simultaneously um, is where the power in some sense comes from, right? So it's, it's, it's similar to saying classically, instead of, you know, you have, a, you have a, a system with an exponential number of states, let's say, uh, you know, N classical bits. And then I have to find a probability distribution, perhaps a graphical model, some probability distribution over all of these states. Mm -hmm. And then classically, we have to basically, you know, do all sorts of horrible approximation tricks or we sample. So basically we define a dynamical process where in every step of the way, we only entertain one particular state in our computer, right? And then we, we create N examples, a small, a small number of examples, and that should be representative of the whole distribution. Now, the, the idea here is, you know, the analogy would be that I can create a state in my computer that has this full probability distribution. And I can now manipulate that state. I can compute marginals. I can do all sorts of things on this entire exponentially large space. Um, that's sort of the computational advantage in some sense that you see. And not all you know, things that you would want to do, let's say classically on this exponentially large state space can actually be done with a quantum computer. It's, it's a very fairly limited set of things that you can sort of exponentially speed up. But of course, there's a lot of research that will try to use quantum computers to do more and more useful things. Um, now, so that's just a computational advantage. Now, now um, so, so the, 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 I don't think there is representational advantage because we, we can classically also write down sort of models over exponential number of states. Um, and, but, the, but, the, but the big question is whether, you know, this is giving us better models in some sense. And um, so you want to write down models that are in this restricted space of being faster to execute on a quantum computer, but still give you, you know, useful models that generalize well and all these things. Now that I believe is unknown, but that's why we're doing this research in my opinion, which mm -hmm. is just going after this idea of sort of somewhat more experimentally without a quantum computer, which is to say, are there classes of models where, you know, you could run them super efficiently, but now we're going to try to see, you know, if we, maybe we can efficiently approximate them still and, and see if that will give us any benefit. And there's you some, mean, you know, mm, yeah, go ahead. You mean classically approximate them? Yes, yeah, classical yeah. approximate, yeah. yeah. So, this but reminds the, me, oh, sorry, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. This reminds me of um, the quantum recommendation system. Uh, there was a paper, I think in 2016 from, uh, uh, Kerenidis and uh, uh, Prakash, I think. And there was this quantum recommendation system paper, which was later inspired um, like a, a classical yeah. algorithm in 2019, I think. Yes. Which was showed similar performance despite being classical, but like yes. the idea was inspired by this. I think there is a great uh, future. So uh, it seems that uh, quantum mechanics gives us new ways of thinking about designing algorithms um, and you know I think there are probably classical systems that um, that are well described by quantum mechanics and 
um, it's kind of interesting to see, well, if you would design such a thing in quantum mechanics, you know, can you, what would be the classical equivalent that you could run still that would describe that thing? So, so you, you can think of, you know, um, and, and, and I feel there's going to be a lot of more, actually, there's also examples like by, by, by a student or Tang, I think she was called, where she showed that, in fact, some algorithms that were claimed to do, to be quantum speed ups, mm -hmm. they were actually not because there existed classical algorithms. And maybe yeah. you're talking about the same thing. I don't know. But, I think uh, it's yes because the author is yeah. Tang, the name of this. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 it 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 could be that a whole lot of things. You know, there there are algorithms which you know you can speed up quantum mechanically, but then in fact there could be classical algorithms which we haven't considered before, mm -hmm. which would sort of simulate that. And I think that's a very exciting direction, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, any question? Any question? Let's check also the YouTube stream, perhaps. Right, so, well, if we don't have any question, we have like time for, for a quick one, perhaps. If there is no question, then I would like to thank again, uh, Professor Welling for, uh, for this very interesting talk. And um, yeah, so thank, thanks again for joining us. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, and just a, a couple of words to remind everybody that uh, the post, well, the discussion sessions are starting in, I need to think because I'm in a different time zone, but well, roughly 40 minutes from now. And so as last, um, as yesterday, you have your own breakout room, you can, um, that, assign, that is assigned to you. So you are recommended to use the, um, the desktop or mobile uh, client of Zoom to actually freely being able to enter and exit from these rooms. Otherwise, you have to ask the co-host, uh, the host to essentially allow you into a room. So if you have the possibility to use the desktop uh, client, uh, please do. And that's all. And then after that, uh, so technically it's meant to last an hour, but it's possible they will last a little bit longer like yesterday if, if there are still people discussing. Remember that we also have a virtual coffee room where we can go and uh, not really have coffee, but just chat. And um, yeah, and we have the TC very importantly at 2.15 uh, PM in the uh, related breakout room. Uh, that's going to start at uh, yeah, 2.15 p.m. And I believe if you cannot see the rooms already, you will be probably able to see them. Uh, uh, I think, open now. Uh, yeah, you can probably, we can probably open now and open them now so you can test that everything works uh, correctly. Most importantly, make sure you can enter the room. And then, uh, uh, yeah, in about half an hour, we are going to start the discussion session, okay? So thanks everybody. Perfect.